Okay, welcome back. So let's once again revisit the data set that we've seen before of our high temperatures to demonstrate finding these measures of spread that we've been talking about. So we're going to look at our high temperature data again. And let's take a look at this over in Excel. So let's start by finding kind of our more rudimentary levels. Now we can find, so there's a couple ways in Excel to find our max, min, find our range. Um, if I sort the data, you could go largest to smallest or smallest to largest. We can easily find our minimum of 100, our maximum of 134. All right, there's also a min function. Right, if you have an unsorted data set, here it's sorted, so we're, it's kind of overkill, but we also have a max function. All right, so to find our range, we can say here is our max, here's our min. So our range is simply max minus min. All right, that's our most rudimentary measure of spread. Another measure of spread, simple one that we're interested in, is often our IQR. Remember, this is our Q1 or Q3 minus Q1. Now, you could find those like we've seen before, counting methods. Um, but with a larger data set, I don't really want to have to count through everything. So I'll show you a new Excel function. If you go to quartile, and now the I'm going to use the dot INC inclusive, then highlight your data, okay, and then you can tell it, you can also get your minimum and maximum from this. This is basically a way to, uh, to get your five number summary, right? Um, but I want my first quartile, so I could type in a one or double click this, and this will give me the first quartile of my data. Similarly, I can find Q3. Right? I could either count or use this quartile function. Let's use inclusive 100 to 134 this time. All right, so there we go. So I've got Q1 and Q3. That means my IQR is this guy minus this guy. All right, so range, IQR, super simple, easy ways of finding spread. Not always that informative, though. OK, so I'm going to get rid of these guys. And let's talk about our variance. Now, I'm going to calculate the variance the long way. It's not that bad if we have Excel. Now, this definitely isn't something you would want to do by hand if you didn't have a computer. But I'm just going to work this out in Excel so that we can kind of see how this works. Okay, so remember the idea is I first have to find the mean. So we found the mean of this data set before, but let's just find it again. I believe it's 114.14. Okay, so there's our mean. Now remember, our first step is we take x minus the mean. Okay, so if we do that for each observation. So 100 minus 114.14. So I want to do that for each observation. All right, remember the point was here. So we, we have a bunch of negatives. We have a bunch of positives. So why can't we just add them up and divide here? Well, if we do that, here we've got some rounding issues, but e to the negative 14th, that's essentially 0. right? They, so they add up to 0 at this point, so that doesn't really help us. So what we do is we then square each of those values. All right, so this guy squared. All right, I've got each of those. Then I sum those up. All right, so this gives me a pretty big number, 2,000 there. Okay, so remember our formula says after I've summed that up, then I divide by either n or n minus 1. 
Now I'm going to treat this both ways as a population variance and standard deviation and as a sample variance and standard deviation just to see what Excel is doing here. Okay, so I've got my sum of those squared deviations. So there's 50 states. So big N right, would be 50. N minus 1, if I was treating it as a sample, would be 49. Okay, so if I take this number, divide by 50, that gives me my variance. If I take this number, divide by 49, that gives me a sample variance. Okay, so we would call this sigma squared. This would be S squared. Let's see what formulas Excel has built in here. Okay, so if I type in VAR variance, it has var dot p. Okay, let's see what it gives us. It gives me that 42.76 number. So what it's doing, when I type in var, the dot p versus dot s tells me is it treating it as a population or a sample. Var dot s should agree with this 43. 0.63, highlight my data, and there we go. So I've calculated my variances. Now a couple ways I could get to my standard deviation from here. You could simply take the square root of that variance to give me my standard deviation. Right, so this would be simply sigma this would be s or or we have built-in functions for that so s standard dev we've got again a dot p I can try the dot p with my entire data set or I can go standard dev dot s with my entire data set all right, and these numbers should match up with what we found manually. So you can use, we found it manually just to kind of show the entire process, or we can use the built-in functions. So our standard deviation here is probably our most appropriate because we've seen this data in a histogram before and it looked pretty symmetric. So if we were to describe the center and spread, we would say, Okay, my mean is about 114.14 with a standard deviation of about 6.6, 6.5-ish. So we did all that manually in Excel. Let's just quickly show how to do it in Minitab. We can go to Stat, Basic Statistics, Display Descriptives, High Temperature, Choose the Statistics of Interest. Right now we're looking at measures of spread, things such as our range, our IQR, our variance and standard deviation. Let's see what Minitab does and how it treats. Because remember we have the, the population variance and standard deviation formulas and the sample standard deviation formulas. Let's see what Minitab pops out. Alright, Minitab is giving me 6.61 as my standard deviation, 43.63 as my variance. So what does that match up with here? Right, it was giving me 6.6 .6 and the 43 number. Minitab, when it's spitting out these descriptive statistics, it's treating your data as a sample. And that's, that's fine because 99% of the time, that's what you'll want. Okay, so let's wrap this up using our standard deviation in the context of z-scores. Right, so let's look at an example here. Your average NBA player is 6'7" put that in terms of inches with a standard deviation of five inches. Right, your average adult male in the United States is 5'10 with a smaller standard deviation. Okay, maybe you recognize these guys because this is a cool picture because it's it's a picture of the shortest NBA player ever, Muggsy Bogues. He was 5'3 and one of the two tallest NBA players ever, George Mearson. Right, so this is a cool picture because they're, they're in the same shot. Now both of these guys' heights are obviously unusual, but we want to think about, okay, what is more unusual? Are they more unusual with respect to 
each other when we're looking at the population of NBA players or the general population. So which guy's height was more unusual for an NBA player? Well, we can find z-scores for each of them. Okay, so zm, that's, that's Muggsy's z-score. zg, that's George Mirasan's z-score. So we said any z-score outside of plus or minus 2 is unusual. So they're both unusual, right? But Muggsy is three standard deviations less than the average NBA player. So he is way more unusual in the NBA. All right, but what about in the general population? Okay, here's Muggsy's Z score for the general population, negative 1.75. Here's George's for the general population, 5.25. Okay, so for the general population, George Mearson is extremely unusual. Right? But Muggsy, yeah, he's he's short, but he's not even unusual for the general population. Okay, so this is how we can use the standard deviation in context to compare things in different distributions. Okay, so thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.